in our series in the Lord's Prayer, this is the heart. This is the meat. And I have never been more terrified of a sermon in my entire life because I want to share how big and how awe-inspiring and how essential this piece is. This is the core of who we are. And there's no way that I can do that in 10 minutes or in 50 minutes. Um, and so my best is that I can hope that this is a conversation starter for all of us. I remember being at a church meeting talking about evangelism, trying to reclaim that word and not being afraid of it and asking people why they're a Christian. And not one person in that group could say why, other than because I've gone to church and my parents brought me to church. I want more than that for us because there is way more at stake for us. And I want to be the kind of Christian that this prayer is the air we breathe. Thy kingdom come. Not my kingdom, not what I want. And I like to think that a lot of times I'm right in what I want, but not what I want. What God wants. The God who calls out Job, who is in the midst of a serious injustice, and introduces to Job an image of creating, an image of the work that God does that is beyond all imagination and way beyond what Job is facing in that moment. And ask Job, as true as his injustice is, to surrender and to submit. And oh my gosh, I hate that word. I'll just own that in all of my feminism that I'm standing before you at this moment. I do not like the word submit. But as a Christian, that is exactly what I am called to do. And if there is anyone that I can submit to... It is a Lord who has given everything, who has completely emptied himself out and given his life so that others might live. I can submit to someone who chooses not to hold power or use it for themselves, but to make it so that all have access and all have wholeness and all have peace. Thy kingdom. It's the call of the prophets that we looked at, right? What does the Lord require of us but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly? What does it look like to surrender? As soon as Jan heard that we were doing this series on the Lord's Prayer, she sent me a picture of a cross from Ireland, Barry. If you would bring it up, thy will be done and shared with me how that was a mantra um, for saying goodbye to her husband and for her husband leaving and being ready for another chapter in the community of saints. Thy will be done. As much as I don't want to submit to it, as much as there might be a very real injustice I am facing, how to let that go and let a God who is more and who is beyond come in. Thy will, thy kingdom. There are days, a lot of days, too many days, where I'm not okay with that kind of surrender. And I need a community that can hold me accountable to work that. And that's the church, except the church isn't very good at it either because what is the church made up? More people who have trouble submitting and surrendering, right? And so there are some days that none of us get it well at all. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he introduces this way of praying. That's 
what we used in the call to worship that hopefully was a little jarring. We don't typically start our worship services off with the intensive question of, are we here as a charade? Why are you here? Are you here playing a game? But there's also a point where we need to be honest about why we're here. And are we here to look spiritual? Are we here to win the spiritual tally. I was in college with a group of competition where the Christian group was more about competition of who was more spiritual than the other. And as a camp counselor over the summer, I kept getting, we didn't have text at that point of time, I kept getting emails of how many of the other camp counselors had won kids over to Christ and there was a tally going. And I'm not saying that as we shouldn't celebrate those who come and accept Christ, because that's kind of the whole point. But to do so in a way that we're using that as a way to prove how good we are or how spiritual we are kind of misses the entire freaking point. So where is our surrender? And where is our humility? And where is there room for God more so than us. That's what Jesus was warning about. When we heap up empty phrases and do that kind of show, that does harm and damage because that's not who Christians are called to be in terms of a people who walk humbly with God. But more than the hypocrisy of who we are as followers, it's horrible theology. It's hypocritical for who God is. Like, we need to heap up empty phrases because it's going to be really hard to get God's attention. And so we have to keep talking and trying. No, God knows before we speak. So we're actually, in doing that, making God to be someone other than who God is. And witnessing completely falsely, which means harmfully. So if we're going to pray for God's kingdom and God's will, then we've got to get out of the way because it's not our kingdom come and our will be done. And we've got to make friends with the S word. And we've got to practice submitting. And we've got to practice holding each other accountable to that. And that's why we've started these small groups because if we're going to say we're Christian, I want us to live lives that back that. I want the air we breathe to be this prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. And that means in every second of my life, for every decision that I am up against, for every moment that I face, I am praying thy will be done, thy kingdom come here and now through me, in me, with me, and in spite of me because we will get it wrong. But I want to us to at least try. And, and the way that I at least understand this trying is being able to give equal weight to God's righteousness and God's mercy. And as a church, we're terrible at this. We are really, really good at doing the righteousness alone of we've got this checklist of what sin is and what sin isn't and what we are going to hold you accountable to or not and who is in and who is out and what it needs to be and what this life looks like and whether or not you have conformed to that and whether your life looks like that or not. But if it's righteousness alone without mercy, that's legalism that leaves no room for the love and the spirit of the law that Christ tried to bring in person, in relationship, in knowing one another and walking with one another. Because as we ended in that call to worship, God's going to ask much of us. But God will be with us every step of the way. And righteousness asks much of us without remembering that God's with us every step of the way without remembering that that's what we're called to be for each other. That it's not enough to just pray for all of those people who are going to hell and separate ourselves from them lest they take us with them. That's a fear-based faith. 
And that does nothing to witness to the people who are lost and who need a guidepost, who have much on their plate, who are facing great battles and could use someone alongside with them witnessing to the power that is available to them to be able to go through what they are facing. But the other side is mercy, right? And we're really good as a church of that. Of There's not really any sin. There's not really any evil. Like, it's really all okay. We're all good people. We all have good intentions. We're fine. That's not okay either. The very first question of our baptism is whether or not we reject the spiritual forces of wickedness and the powers of evil. If there wasn't any evil, then why the heck did Christ die? And why did he cry out on a cross, Eli, Eli, lavak sabatani? Why did he feel forsaken? Why did he feel the weight of being overwhelmed by the brokenness and the impossibility of it all? It's real. Evil is real. And if we, the people who are to be the witnesses and the community that stands against that, and offers a different and a new way, a new kingdom over and against that, and we're the ones who are saying it doesn't exist and it's all fine? Ha <laughs> ha, no. We have to be a people that can call what is evil, evil, and can do so in love, in relationship. Can we have a moment for how much our world needs that right now as our government is shut down? In a moment because we haven't been able to pair righteousness and mercy together? Our witness, who we are, is desperately essential. And I want us, Epworth, to be the church that prays thy kingdom come and thy will be done and does something about it. I'm going to read a really hard letter from our bishop, and it's going to ruffle a lot of feathers and be very uncomfortable. But if you can do give the gift of taking a deep breath and breathing through the pieces that really, I'm just going to say it, piss you off. If you can be present and just hear in it how she is drawing the line of righteousness and naming evil for evil and also offering mercy and praying for a way forward. None of us are going to do this perfectly. None of us are going to do this well. And this is going to be a really messy process because we are praying for heaven to be on earth before Christ's return while there is still real evil afoot. So understanding that this is not the perfect moment either, understanding that this is not everything being beautiful and right and in place. But understanding this as a witness for a possibility of how we pair righteousness and mercy and how we enter the mess instead of being afraid of it and staying out of it. And I want this to start conversation whether that be in the small groups as we pray for a way forward, whether that be after fellowship hour, however this looks, may we start thinking together of how we be Christians whose daily breath, the air we breathe, is this prayer, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Our bishop wrote this statement in response um, to President Trump's um, remarks on Haiti and other African nations. She wrote this right before Monday, um, before Martin Luther King Jr. Day. On Monday, January 15th, our country will again celebrate the work of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. As we do so, we remember his prophetic words that hatred paralyzes life and love releases it that hatred confuses life, that love harmonizes it, 
that hatred darkens life, that love illuminates it. With these words resounding in our hearts, it's hard to reconcile the reported statement of President Trump, who used racist and defamatory language to speak about Haiti and several African nations. With these statements, President Trump's fitness for office is no longer in question. One cannot lead while demonstrating blatant disregard and disrespect for entire segments of the population. It does not matter that those disparaged are from another continent or country. The implied effect of disparaging individuals from Haiti or Africa while extolling those from Norway belies a disdain for persons of color that is undeniable and unacceptable from the leader of the free world. I cannot understand those who seek to justify his comments as putting America first. We are first when we lead with decency and honor, equity, integrity, and equality. We are not first when we espouse racism and bias, discrimination and inequality. That does not make us strong, rather it makes us weak. For those who are religious, humanists, patriots in the truest sense of the term, or otherwise decent human beings, there can be no quarter for anyone practicing or supporting racism. Any form of hatred or bigotry that attempts to place a hierarchy on the value of human life is unacceptable. As United Methodists, we embrace the scriptural truths, which are also reiterated in paragraph 3371 of our book of Re resolutions, that all women and men are made in God's image and all persons are equally valuable in the sight of God. We must work toward a world in which each person's value is respected and nurtured. But just noting our concern about racism and intolerance is not enough. We are a people of social holiness. As it states in paragraph 5012 of the Book of Resolutions, scripture recognizes that faithfulness to God requires political engagement by the people of God. The church should continually exert a strong ethical influence upon the state, supporting policies and programs deemed to be just and opposing policies and programs that are unjust. As Americans, the office of the president warrants our respect. And I do, in fact, respect that office. I respect it so much that I demand the holder of that office conduct themselves with the utmost integrity. With these comments, as reported, that standard has not been met. Therefore, there is no room for silence or justification or equivocation or obfuscation. We are called to choose decency, love, and justice. Words have power. We must hold ourselves and our leaders accountable for our words and the actions they inspire. I call upon all members and churches of the Baltimore Washington Conference to pray and to act so that justice and equality for all people stands as a guiding principle for our leaders and the law of our land. Let us be illuminated by love. I understand that these words will not feel illuminated by love for all of us. And I understand that this is a time and a place and a sermon that asks us to live into something that is very disturbing and uncomfortable, possibly at exactly the time people were looking for comfort and moving forward in the battles that they are facing. I name this because of our bishop asking us to, but also because it is our call to find a way to be both righteous and merciful. And this is not an easy call, but it, it is the call of those who follow Christ, of those who ask for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I pray for grace myself, for God to work through me, in me, with me, and in spite of me. And I pray for grace for all of us as we do our best to wed righteousness and mercy, to live as followers of God's kingdom, that God might work through us, in us, with us, and in spite of us. Amen. <laughs>